So we're going to uh, turn to God's Word. We're going to turn to God's Word. And uh, I've titled my message today as Birth of a Vision. Birth of a Vision. There is a man named Nehemiah in the Bible who gave birth to a vision. Eventually, this vision caused him to become one of the greatest builders of the Old Testament. In fact, Nehemiah built a wall, a wall of protection around Jerusalem. It was a huge task. He had to have the buy-in of many people, and all these people bought into his vision, and he managed to build this entire wall fast and efficiently, despite several oppositions from many, many people. So it is a great story. It is a great story, and I think it, it is a story that will motivate us this morning to also know that we can give birth to a vision. Hallelujah. This Nehemiah was not a prophet. Nehemiah was not a, was not a priest. He was not a king. He was simply an employee of one of the most powerful kings of those days. And he was just an employee. He had a great job, but nothing more, nothing more than that, nothing special about him. But somehow, somehow, he gave birth to a vision that caused so many people to be blessed. And maybe God can use that story to speak into our life so that we may give birth to a vision. Hallelujah. Now, his vision was not a worldly vision. Now, we talk about a vision, most of us think about a worldly vision. We think about, yeah, I want to lose weight. Yeah, I want to do, uh, finish my education. You know, all those things are good, and we do need uh, uh, some of those visions. And uh, every corporation, every big business has, has some kind of a worldly vision. Tesla, for example, has a vision to drive the world's transition to electric vehicles. And uh, that's a great vision. And uh, I read it, and I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. Because they're not saying we just want to create electric vehicles. They, they are saying that we want to drive the movement that moves uh, people to drive EV cars. So uh, that's a great vision to have for a great organization. And, uh, but I'm talking more in line with a godly vision. You know, the plans and purposes that God has for you and your life and the plans and purposes that God has for His kingdom. And, and we pray, uh, every time when we pray, we say, you know, thy kingdom come, you know. So aligning our vision with, with, the, with the kingdom mentality, with God's plan for our lives and for, for the future of this, uh, for mankind. So this is really uh, what I'm talking about this morning. Aligning our visions and giving birth to a godly vision in our life. Amen? So let's read a few verses, Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1, and onwards, the Bible says the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the middle of Chislev in the 20th year, as I was in Susa, the citadel. Now Susa was a, a winter palace of the Persian kings. Those days they had a winter palace and a summer palace. So, so here is uh, Nehemiah at, at Susa in the citadel, that Han and I, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and the gates are destroyed by fire. Now, this report set off a series of events and actions in the, lives of, uh, in the life of Jer Nehemiah that caused him to give birth to a vision. And we're going to go through some of those, and we're going to understand what caused a birth of a vision and such great changes in his own life and in the lives of other people. See, when God gives you a vision... It's got to change you first. Something's got to happen in you first before it can spread and an action can come out and somebody else can be blessed out of that. So here we see Nehemiah's life is uh, getting that vision. He's getting that vision. Now, 
who is this Nehemiah? Nehemiah's job, like I said, was just an ordinary job. He was the cup bearer. It was a very important job to bear the cup for the king. The king had to trust you because in those days, somebody uh, who wants to kill the king would poison his drink. And uh, so the cup bearer was to actually taste the drink first, make sure it's safe for the king to drink. And uh, he would bear the cup, he would hold the cup and give it to, uh, to, the, to the king. So it was a very, very important position. He had the ear of the king and he could speak to the king. He heard what the king said on a daily basis. So it was a very um, important position, but nevertheless, in, in kingdom uh, um, talk, we could say that it was not that big of a deal. You know, if you were a pastor or if you were a priest or if you were a prophet, we would have said, oh yeah, that's, that's a great position in the, in the kingdom of God. But a cupbearer, we might think like that's nothing, but God used that cupbearer to do great things. God made sure that a great vision was birthed to this through this man named Nehemiah. And uh, that is why I think it's such a great encouragement to all of us because God can use anybody. God can use you. God can use your children. God can uh, uh, use somebody who just got saved. God can use somebody who is broken. God can use somebody who has been defeated. God can use anybody. And, and maybe this morning God is speaking to you and he's saying, I can use you. If only you can give birth to a vision that I have for you. If your vision can align with my vision. Amen? So, what is the report that Nehemiah heard that he's so troubled about? Nehemiah heard that his brothers who are living in Jerusalem are in shame and despair and trouble. Why? Because the walls were broken. And in ancient days, when your walls were broken... It meant that anybody with a with hundred guys and a sword can walk into your city, plunder a section of your city, take whatever they want, and they can walk away in the, into the darkness. And you had no idea who did it. And this could happen again and again and again all the time. So, so the people were in great trouble. They had to come back to Jerusalem. They were living in Jerusalem. They wanted to follow God. They, they were excited to be in Jerusalem. But life in Jerusalem was very difficult because they had no walls. They had no protection. And they were in shame because anybody and everybody was, was attacking them. And they could not protect themselves. And, and, and when Nehemiah heard this... It transformed this ordinary cup bearer into this master builder because something about the news affected him and touched him, which, which actually brings me to my very first point. To give birth to a godly vision, you must come in contact with a need. You must come in contact with a need. When you come in contact with a need, that triggers you to give birth to a vision. You know, I remember Doris and I, we came to this uh, church uh, 2009, 2009. I had no idea that, <laughs> that I'll survive so long in, this, in, this, uh, in Dorian. But uh, what a great journey it's been. You know, uh, I remember uh, I had no vision to build a building. I had no vision to start a building project. You know, I, I'm not good at building anything. And uh, the guys in the, in the church know that. I'm not good at building anything. But you know what happened? Uh, I went to the city because we used to have Christmas banquets. You know, since COVID, it's been hard. But we used to have Christmas banquets. And, and my vision was always uh, to use the Christmas banquet to invite as many people as you can. And we used to invite uh, the very first Christmas banquet. I think we had about 150 people. The church was very small, but we managed to bring 150. That was a huge accomplishment. And uh, the second one, we brought in 250 people. And uh, we used to go to the city and borrow a hall, rent a hall, and we used to do the Christmas banquet. It used to be exciting. But soon the city said, you know, we cannot give you the, the, the building anymore because you are, you are a religious organization, and we cannot give religious organization space. And that really bothered us. That really... Uh, that really became very troubling to us. As we walked 
we would go from city to city. We went and asked for the Omni Center, the Opti Center, whatever center the city has, we'd ask for it. And we always got back the same answer. And we were very discouraged. And we said, God, you know, everybody else has a nice building. Everybody else has something where they can meet and do their stuff. But, you know, in, here in Quebec, it's such a difficult thing. And that's when the, 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 the vision to build a new building was birth, friends. You need to come in contact with a need. You need to come in contact with a need before a godly vision can, can start to inspire you and start to motivate you and you start to do something about it. You know, so uh, that is how the church building project came, is just going to the city and asking for space and them saying no. A few times later, we said, you know, enough is enough. We want to have our own space where we can do whatever we want to do. Amen. With some restrictions, of course. Um, what about the Dream Center? You know, there used to be a lady in our church uh, many, many years ago. And one day she came to Doris and she, she said to Doris, you know, uh, Pastor Doris, if you, if, you, um, if you have any leftover bread, even if it's moldy, it's okay. If you have any leftover bread, please give it to me because I would use that to feed myself and my kids. When Doris heard that, she was heartbroken. You know, she, she, she wanted to do something for the community. She wanted to do something for people like her. And we had no means, we had no money. Uh, we, we didn't know what to do for people like that, how to help them. And uh, that started the Dream Center. That is the, the seeds of the ministry called the Dream Center. In fact, we call it the Dream Center because she had a dream for feeding the community, friends. So, so always godly vision is given birth when you come in contact with a need. There are so many needs around us. Find a need that attracts you towards it. Find a need that attracts you towards it. And, and, and ask God, God, can I give birth to a vision in this area? It will not be easy. There will be times when you feel like there is no support. There will be times where even your pastor won't understand you. There will be times when, when, when you look, think that so-and-so is going to help me with finances or so-and-so is going to help me with, 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 uh, with uh, labor, but you won't get it. But I'll tell you, God will make it happen through places that you don't expect and through means that you don't expect. Somehow it is going to happen because it is a vision that is birthed through the need that, that is going to be met only by the grace and strength of God. Can I hear an amen? All right. Number two, giving birth to a godly vision. Something needs to happen without, within you. A, a sympathy or a compassion needs to rise up within you. You know, yes, there are so many needs. I, I look around, I see so many needs, but not every need drives me to compassion. Not every need causes me to uh, uh, sympathize with, with those people. Sometimes I think, you know, these people, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> their bad choices or whatever is causing them to go through the difficult time. I might think like that and be judgmental sometimes <laughs> and not really have a sympathy for them. But, you know, when, when, when you are about to birth a godly vision, there, there's a sympathy that just empathy or, or compassion that just comes up within you, and you just want to do something. And that's exactly what you see in the life of Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 4, Nehemiah says, as soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. What happens is he hears this news, and it, it shakes him so much that he's weeping and mourning before God. You know, friends, when was the last time anything caused you to weep and mourn before God? When was the last time anything shook you that you now had to act upon it? Not many things shake us anymore because we have become so desensitized. We have become so desensitized with the news around the world and, and, and the chaos and the calamity that, that we have just stopped trying 
to make a difference in the lives of people. Friends, I pray that, that just as Jesus was moved with compassion, the Bible says when Jesus saw the multitude of crowd, he looked at those people and he realized that these people are like sheep without a shepherd. And the Bible says he was moved with compassion. And I pray that God will move your hearts with compassion for something that is happening right in your neighborhood, for something that is happening in the church, for something that is happening in our time, in our generation. May God just shake it. And, and prepare something new, a new oil, a new anointing in your life to, to go out and, 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 and be a difference maker, something that will cause sympathy and, and, and compassion to rise up from within you. You know, there's a generation of people growing up today who don't know Jesus. There's a generation of people that are growing up today in our church that don't know Jesus. There are young people today who are looking around and saying, does anybody love me? Do Christians even love me? Do, does my pastor care for me? There's, a, there's so many needs. There's so many needs. And, and, and we need to be moved by those things. Something's got to move us. Something's got to move us. Are you ready to be moved? Are you ready to be moved? Are you ready to be moved so that God can give birth to a vision in your life. Number three, the third step, that's an important step in giving birth to a vision is this. The need needs to bond to you. The need needs to bond to you. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that there are things that you see and you're concerned and you may be even compassionate about it and you may do something about it but there are some needs that just can't be shaken off. There are people in prisons. Maybe there are some people, it's as if like, it's as if like somebody's got a magnet within them. You know, I see people, uh, sometimes people come to me and share with me their vision for, let's say, prison ministry. You know, I don't have a magnet. I, I feel, I feel uh, compassionate towards those people. I want to help those people, but... I'm not greatly moved by it, you know? So I never really ventured into that area of ministry, but there is probably somebody here right now, probably someone listening to me right now, who's thinking about those people in prison and thinking, if only I could make a difference in their lives. And I've always wanted to be part of an orphanage. I've always wanted to maybe open an orphanage. For some reason, I could never shake it. It, in fact, it's one of my dreams to do that ministry one day when, when God opens the way. You know, I, I could never shake that. I tried for many uh, years to go do other things. But, you know, that ministry has always been there uh, from my childhood is to be a blessing to other young kids. So uh, maybe one day I will start that. But, you know, I've never been able to shake that. So I think there's a magnet for certain ministries within certain people. And that is very important because the, those things will stick to you and become part of you. And everything that you do and everything you think somehow drives you towards that particular need, that particular need. And that's, you know that that's a clue that you're going to give birth to a vision. Hallelujah. You're going to give birth to a vision. Now, uh, in this verse, in verse number four, it says that, Nehemiah sat and wept and mourned for days. He continued fasting and praying. It's not just a one-day thing. It's just not an inspiration after listening to the pastor preach. It's not just like, oh, I feel good about that. I, I, I just got to go do something. It was not just like that. It was for days he was weeping and mourning and fasting and praying and crying before God. It, he just could not shake it because that was really, really a process of giving birth to something special. What are some of those dreams that you once had that you've forgotten about? Maybe God is drawing attention to those things. Maybe God is saying, you know, I, I, 
you had a dream, you had a vision to do this in ministry, and, and you tried it, and it was difficult, so you gave up, but, but know that I am with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Whatever you're doing, I am going to be with you. Well, friend, let me tell you something. Just because God gave you a vision, it's not going to be easy. How many of you like fasting, you know? Fasting, I don't want to do it willingly. I'll do it if I'm made to fast, if I am forced to fast. But willingly, fasting, giving up on meat, giving up on steak, I can't imagine that, you know? Unless maybe the doctor tells me, give up meat, I would do it. And, um, uh, but you know what? I, I, I think it's difficult, but, but uncomfortable. Let's put it that way. Uncomfortable. And uh, visions can cause you to do uncomfortable things. Bring you out of your comfort zone. Humble yourself before people. Cause you to be broken. Cause you to make some missteps. I've done some foolish things in my life that I'm still embarrassed about. <laughs> I, I, I remember I had a dream, I had a vision to preach. And uh, my first sermon I preached is in, was in 1991. That sermon is still on YouTube, and I never watch it, <laughs> because that is one of the most embarrassing sermons I've ever preached. I can't believe I preached that, and people listened to that. I wonder what people were thinking as I'm preaching that. So I never watched that. You know, it is so embarrassing. But you know what? Visions can cause you to do things that are not comfortable, Take you out of your comfort zone, but God has a plan and purpose because it is aligned with the will of God. It's not going to be easy, but it's aligned with the will of God. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. Are you ready to give birth to a vision? How many of you ladies would say giving birth to a child was easy? It's never easy. Even with all the medication and everything that they have now, it's never easy. Giving birth is never easy. And, uh, and uh, giving birth to a vision is never easy. But God is calling you to be fruitful and multiply in, in, in your giftings that he has given you. Amen? Number four. Number four. When, when you know that you have a vision, when you're about to give birth to a vision, that vision will become a burden eventually it will become a burden. I'll tell you why you need to have a burden. Because people do not want to follow a person who does not have a burden for something. Amen? Back to the, our human experience. When you want to give birth to a baby, I remember my wife uh, pregnant with three boys, and uh, it was not easy. It was not easy for her. It was not easy for me. Uh, it was tough. It was a tough time, but it was the best time. It was great. It was great. Great. My kids are amazing. I love them so much. But those 10 months or so were difficult times. You know, she could not sleep properly. She had to throw up, and, uh, and uh, all of a sudden she had a craving for the strange food, you know, go buy me this, or something like that. Let's go. I would, sometimes we would drive far away to a specific restaurant to buy a specific kind of food. You know, it was, it was tough times for her, but you know what? It was a burden. But that burden caused her to give birth to three amazing boys. Let me tell you, unless there is a burden in our life, the vision will never come to fruition. Maybe there's a burden in you to see children saved. Maybe there's a burden in you to see our young people thrive. Maybe there's a burden in you to, to uh, go to church and, and hear the greatest worship. Maybe there's a burden in you to see our church clean. You know, there's a young, young uh, adult that called us yesterday and said, you know, Pastor, uh, if there's anything for, us to, for me to do uh, at church, please let me know. And he's coming today to uh, clean the church. And I'm thinking, wow, he doesn't have to do that. 
But you see, there's a magnet. There's a magnet within him. That he, he's giving birth to something special, to, to serving God, to, 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 to uh, be a blessing in, in the kingdom of God. You know, the bonding process is not emotional. The bonding process uh, is almost methodical, intentional, prayerful, careful. And, 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 the, and, the, and the burden now bonds with you. And it's now one with you. And wherever you go, whatever you do, you're carrying that burden in your life. There's a man named John Knox in the 1500s. He prayed this way. He said, give me Scotland or I die. He prayed that way because he wanted to see Scotland saved. You know, and uh, many years later, uh, in the 1800s, there was a missionary to India. His name was John Hyde. Uh, he, he, he was a man of prayer. He kept praying so much that eventually they call him Praying Hyde. And he prayed this way. He said, God, give me India or else I die. It was just a burden for souls. was so great that he would just do nothing else but pray. Take them out of their comfort zone. Go into a strange country. Learn their language. Go live there. Understand their culture. Understanding their customs. And, and trying to love those people. You know, what can make you do something like that? Only the fact that there's a burden within you that you just cannot get rid of. You know, I, sometimes I think about our missionaries. You know, I had a missionary friend. He, he, he did missionary work for many years in India. And he, he's now a pastor in Massachusetts. So uh, we went to see him and, and talked to him. And I, I said, you know, how was the experience being a missionary for so many years? And he said to me, you know, David, I was a missionary for so many years in India. And the one question I have in my heart is, did I really make a difference? That's what a burden will do to you. You always want to make a difference. You always want to, to build people. You always want to serve people. You will never do ministry because it, it fits your ego. You will never do ministry because uh, the pastor appreciates you. You will never do ministry because you get recognized. You will do ministry because you, you're serving somebody else and and you know that you're making a difference in somebody else. That is a burden, my friends. And it's hard to explain, but it's one of the most beautiful feelings that you can ever have in your life. Do you have a burden for people? Do you have a burden to serve people? Sometimes people will never say thank you. Or they may say thank you, but they will forget. But it's not about them, it's about the vision, the burden that you have. Read Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 6. Nehemiah is praying to God, let your ear be attentive and your ears, eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel. How did he pray? He prayed day and night. Day and night he had this burden and he came before God and he's praying, God, save the people of Israel. That's a burden that he carried in his life. I wish there's some young people rise up and say, I have a burden for Vaudreuil. I have a burden for St. Lazare. I have a burden for Quebec. I have a burden for Montreal. You know, friends, we need more people, more ministries, more young leaders rising up, serving God. Hallelujah. We need more broken people. We need more vulnerable people. We need these people to step up and say, God, I'm not perfect, but here I am. Use me. You know, I never like perfect people. I don't like working with perfect people because they intimidate me. Because I'm not perfect. <laughs> I've got a ways to go. I have a friend who, who called me from the US now and then and he asked me, uh, are you perfect yet? <laughs> and and uh, are you living a victorious life is what he would ask me. And, uh, or he would ask me, um, is Vaudreuil saved yet? <laughs> and uh, it's, it's so funny. Uh, whenever he asks me that question, it makes me wonder, where am I in my own spiritual walk? And, uh, and um, you know what, friends? Don't be worried that you're broken or um, uh, not 100%. You're just a cupbearer, but God wants to use you. He wants to birth a vision in your life. Do it the right way. Do it the right way. 
All right. Number five, and with this I'll finish. This is very important that all of us hear this. A godly vision will come with a sense of accountability. Hear me again. A godly vision will come with a sense of accountability. Nehemiah was a cupbearer. He got a godly vision, was to leave everything and go to Israel and start building the wall. The task was way beyond him, way above his, his uh, capability, but that was the vision that God had given him. Now, Nehemiah could have sneaked out of the palace, got on his pony, and trotted away to Israel and said, Adios, hasta la vista, I'm going to do my vision. But that's not what he did. The next day he shows up to work and he stands before the king bearing his cup. I'll tell you, when you hire people for ministry, always hire people who are successful in their secular work. People who are not successful in their secular work will never be successful in ministry. And, uh, and, uh, and Nehemiah was dedicated and accountable to his master, the king, even though his king did not know God, even though his king was not a godly king and his job was simply to carry a cup, taste it and give it to the king, he still did it faithfully. That is what people with vision do, as opposed to people who just have a, have, who do it for, let's say, a purpose of ego or purpose of, uh, I think I'll be cool at singing. I think I'll be cool at leading worship. I think I'll be cool if I preached. Versus people who say, you know what, I have a word from God. I cannot help but deliver it. Jeremiah says, the word of God is like a fire burning within me. It's a burden that I'm carrying around wherever I go. I have to speak it. That's vision. Let me read you another verse, Nehemiah chapter 5, verse 15. The former governors, Nehemiah's talking about, see, eventually Nehemiah be, became a governor of, uh, of uh, Jerusalem. And he's saying, the former governors who were before me laid a heavy burden on the people and took for, from them for their daily ration 40 shekels of silver. Even their servants lorded it over the people, but I did not do so because of the fear of God. I read that and said, amazing, what a great man of God. We think about people like Elijah who are like bringing fire from heaven as great men of God, you know, but here's Nehemiah who's saying like, you know, the governors before me used to charge a lot of money for, for preaching or used to charge a lot of money for, for uh, uh, being a governor. But you know what I said, I fear God, I'm not going to do that. And if you read a few more verses, you see amazingly at, at how he lived his life. He never asked for money to do what he's doing. I know there are times when a pastor should be paid, a servant should be paid, and ministry leader should be paid, but uh, that is important. But when they put that above serving God, they're not ready for ministry yet. Nehemiah came with a package. His package was accountability, serving the right way. Friends, just because God called you doesn't mean you can do whatever you want. God called me to be a pastor in this church, but that doesn't mean I can do whatever I want. Every time I do something, I have to send an email to my board and ask them, hey guys, can I do this? Can I spend this money? Sometimes I spend the money and then ask for forgiveness. That's another story. <laughs> but uh, but uh, again, it's all for the building, guys. It's all for the building. But even so, there is an accountability that I have to these people because, uh, because that is what people who have a godly vision will do. Our dream center has a board. We have a treasurer. 
Every money that comes in is counted, it's put in the bank. We don't even see it. We, we don't touch money, we don't handle money. Why? Why do we have to do that? Why can't I just go and give myself a raise? Why can't I do all these things? Why should I even build a building? I could have made double my salary if we didn't have to build this building. Because if it's a godly vision, you'll be ready to die on the altar and say, I'm ready, Lord, to die as a living sacrifice to worship you. So I don't know who God is speaking to this morning. Maybe God is speaking to you. Maybe you have always wanted to do something, but you never did it. Maybe God is putting the vision again in your heart. But I'll tell you, friends, I'll tell you, with this I'll finish. I'll conclude, my conclusion is, vision will ultimately cause you to take that first step. Will, take, will cause you to take that first step. If you never took that first step, it's maybe not a vision, it's just a dream. You want to do it, but you're not fully doing it. But if it's a godly vision, it'll eventually cause you to take that first step. You don't need a pastor or, or somebody to affirm you. You look for the affirmation of God. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this uh, wonderful opportunity to uh, serve you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to serve you as the pastor of this church. I know what I'm speaking about when I, when I uh, preach a sermon like this about the vision being born and the burden being strong. Lord, I pray that each and every one of us will also give birth to a vision and allow God's vision to transform and change our lives little by little. Help us to be like Isaiah, crying out and saying, God, send me, send me. Help us to be that way, Lord.